Good afternoon or good morning if you are in the Americas and good afternoon if you're in Africa or Europe. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the sustainable fishery session. Um, this is a very important session um, because of the importance of food security, um, the blue economy, and also with certain issues related to climate change. Um, we will uh, join these excellent speakers and hear their views. Our original moderator could not join, so I'm Greg Jenkins. I am the co-host for the Air Summit, and I'm here in Portugal, so I'm filling in. But we want to go through these five presentations, and here are our speakers for this morning, Kwame Ajakum from the University of Ghana, Benvindo Fosia from Aymar, Serge Raymaker from Abalobi, <laughs> sorry, Marcio Avela from Bahia, and Michael Riccio from NOAA in the US. Um, we're going to start with Kwame um, and uh, have his presentation come up now. Kwame? Kwame, can you hear me? Could you share your screen for your presentation? Looks like we may have lost Kwame. Not sure. Well, we'll wait to get Kwame back. Uh, so let's go on next to Serge. Hi, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll kick off um, and then Kwame will probably um, come back. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, please just give me a signal when you can see my screen because I can't see you anymore. It's good. All right, great stuff. So hi, my name is Serge. I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm going to dive straight into um, small scale fisheries and, and kind of the, 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 the journey towards sustainable fisheries within, within the small scale fisheries sector. Um, you might be well aware that very often uh, one looks at small scale fisheries or one looks at fisheries from um, and trying to achieve sustainable fisheries with, with a market approach, a market approach that, that again very often rewards well performing, performing fisheries, in fact selects for, for well performing fisheries and if those fisheries are not yet performing well um, according to, to those frameworks. Um, People or groups called fishery projects. Now, in my context, in, in my work, I um, have experienced those fisheries improvement projects that aim to take you to, to a sustainable fishery. They often drag along um, and they often uh, lack the local legitimacy at the fisher level. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that they very often um, do not connect with a benefit sharing mechanism at that local level. And so my, my talk is, um, is presenting a case study, a, a case study close to home. There are a few others around the world, but a, a case study that, that looks at this a, a little bit differently and tries to approach um, sustainable fisheries from, from, from the bottom up. So I work for an organization called um, Abalobi. Abalobi means, um, means small scale fisheries in a, in a local Bantu language here in, in South Africa. And before I, I come back to, to Abalobi, um, the focus on small scale fisheries for, for us is, 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 is multifold. One, you know, we, we often talk about the blue economy um, um, as, you know, being the, the seventh or the, one of the largest economic sectors um, worth, um, worth trillions of, of, of dollars and where, where fisheries play a critical role. At the same time, 50 to 60 percent of the global catch originates from small-scale fisheries, um, who are often informal in nature. 
and nevertheless have much of their catch traded internationally. We estimate that around 60 million people are involved in small scale fisheries. 90% of those people um, um, are involved in, in these fisheries and 160 million are involved in the ancillary activities linked to, linked to the small scale fishing activity. Yet, small scale fisheries are largely left out of sustainable development initiatives, including the, the blue economy, which very often puns, you know, sustainable development, sustainable fisheries. Um, at the same time, in, in our work, in, in our context, we, we very often see a, a, a disconnect between the fishery, the catch, and, and the market um, with, with perverse incentives that drive, as you mentioned earlier, Gregory, o -o -o overfishing. Um, small scale fishers often lack the, the opportunity to participate in, in decision making processes. Um, are, are overpowered by, by market forces, by, by competition with, with other sectors, and have no visibility in, in the market, in a very often opaque um, supply chain. At the same time, that market, you know, even though there is an, there is an interest in, um, in, in, in more transparency, in, in diversity, um, we, we, we very often see a market that, um, that focus on, on a few species and has no, no connection with, with, with traditional fishers or small scale fisheries. Um, over the last couple of years, um, we've tried to approach this, this problem or this, this complex wicked problem. We've tried to approach it um, with, with technology or at least with technology as a, as a tool to drive a particular process, a particular theory of change. And so Abelobi is a traceability platform, um, but a traceability platform with a difference in the sense that it connects um, small scale fishers with the market, but it starts with the small scale fishers. Small scale fishers who use a logbook, who utilize a platform that they own, where they can you know, manage their accounts, they can manage their operation, manage the fleet, manage their cooperative, but at the same time push a, a, a version or a component of their data through a digital supply chain to connect directly with the market. The market being restaurants, being, being you, you and I, being, being re retailers. And this traceability platform is superimposed on a transactional platform that allows transparent and efficient real-time payments, split payments to whoever played a key role in that supply chain, whether it's the crew member on the boat or the woman um, providing the post-harvest um, service in, 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 in the catch. Um, it looks a bit like this, um, where um, we've implemented this in South Africa over the last couple of years, uh, with fishers going out at sea, um, connecting their catch to a physical uh, tag, which is, can be a RFID tag, a QR code, and pushing that through a collective structure in a, in a, a, in a, in a supply chain that allows the consumer to, um, to, to have a guarantee of, of traceability, have a guarantee of pro provenance, but also connect with the story of who these fishers, um, these fishermen, these fisherwomen are, providing a diversity of, of catch and having very often a very different story and a different pathway towards sustainability than uh, more mainstream or other commercial, commercial fisheries. What we've seen, of course, is that it's not about the tech. Um, the tech is an interesting layer to add and perhaps to fast track or scale a program, but it is really about that, that co-design, that collaborative you know, decision-making and, um, and that self-empowerment journey of fishers along the way, trying to take uh, or re re reconfigure their, um, their position within, within a market. Um, this is a long slide, or this is a slide with a lot of information. Don't worry too much about it. But in a nutshell, the way we've approached this in, in South Africa, instead of the market directing what it, what it wants or how it needs to reward um, sustainable fisheries, we've approached this from the angle where we engage with fishermen and fisherwomen around the concept of data collection, the value propositions of data collection for personal accounting, for applying for fishing rights, for connecting with various financial services, especially in a very informal sector. But throughout, as they post their catch on the marketplace, learn along the way and stimulate collective action that allows for value retention, value rescue at a community level and a larger ownership of the, uh, of the supply chain. That in turn drives um, an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to 
look at the fishery at a collective level with the data that has been collected through the system and this marketplace experimentation or this marketplace journey and to benchmark these fisheries, to benchmark these fisheries, not only against ecological, social, or um, not only against ecological indicators, but also against economic and, and social um, indicators and really try and drive uh, a more bottom up triple impact fisheries improvement program. Um, what I'm showing you here are some preliminary results where um, in fishing communities that have adopted this program or side on, on this program, besides a very clear socioeconomic impact because fishers are connecting directly with the market, earning a fair return for their catch, um, we've seen even before a formalized fisheries improvement project, we've seen change in fishing behavior towards um, lesser known species, uh, often undervalued species, but also very often abundant species um, that are, I don't know, not, not overfished. And so that's an interesting one for us. That's a tipping point that allows us to, um, to realize or prove that, again, working from the bottom up um, through a journey of self-empowerment, utilizing various digital um, technologies can drive a triple impact opportunity for, for, for small scale fisheries. And I don't have too much time, but um, this is my last slide, um, connecting again to that first slide where I showed you that disconnect and where we feel quite strongly or we've, we've, we've proven a few times in, in the places like South Africa and places like Seychelles, that, that that digital connection, especially in, in, in the world we live in now, can play a role, if implemented correctly, in driving sustainable fisheries in very complex fisheries, such as, um, such as small-scale fisheries. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Um, that was a uh, very innovative talk. I, I know we're gonna follow up with this uh, very insightful look. Uh, Kwame, are you able to go, give it a go? Yes, yes. Um, I can turn on my video uh, because it draws a lot of bandwidth. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it off, but I'll, I'll share my screen, then we can proceed. Super. Perfect. Hello, can you, can everyone see my screen, please? Yes, we see, and we hear you well. All right, good, good. So I'm gonna talk about promoting sustainable fisheries using earth observation technologies. Um, like you all know, um, I mean, the, there's a huge biodiversity of fish within the Gulf of Guinea region, but for some time now, due to poor management, um, we are losing all the, the different stocks. Um, so in Ghana, we have a declining case, and um, especially the small fishery sector is largely affected. I mean, the, the, the low catches we get from that sector is largely due to the overcapacity of that, that uh, fishery uh, sector. Uh, there are more than 10,000 canoes. And um, when we also consider our semi-industrial fleets that are able to go a bit far and are able to also target a semi-industrial, no, the demersal fishes, uh, there are about close to 100 of them. Then we also have about 400 industrial fishing fleets that are registered in, in Ghana. And um, they target high value fishes like tuna and so forth, right? Um, again, the region is also played with a, a lot of IU fishing cases. So most of the um, fleets that go out there sometimes use more fishing as a, a size, they also engage in uh, in the inshore exclusion zone that are largely um, kept for canoes and semi-industrial fleets. There are a lot of transshipment, pair trolling, and all the um, illegal things you can think of. I mean, this is largely because we we are working hard to have a, a strong uh, monitoring uh, surveillance uh, unit. But sometimes I don't think they are able to do much. And uh, these huge boats with huge engine power take advantage of all of that. Um, we all know issues that are also tied to climate change. I mean, the 
continuous warming of the ocean will definitely affect, affect the upwelling. So uh, there is also that reduced intensity and duration of seasonal upwelling, which drives most of the small pelagic species. So in short, um, there isn't much out there to catch. So the uh, effort to manage the fish resources, I mean, um, while some of them are maintaining capture fisheries production at current levels, we don't want to go beyond what we are taking from the ocean now. Um, we also have to adopt measures that can allow us to get a lot of revenue so that uh, the fisher folks, um, those in, in that sector are able to make money to take care of their families, put food on the table and so forth, right? Um, there are tons of activities going on to ensure that we have a, we maintain the sort of stocks that we want to have. But one of the key things that happened somewhere about, I think 2010, 2012, there about, was this World Bank project that looked at building policies, improving policies, uh, building capacity of fisheries managers to reduce IU fishing, um, address issues that affect um, the changes and how it will affect um, communities and fisher folks. So two key things, uh, or two key components of that, that uh, strategy was, one, how do we reduce uh, illegal fishing, right? Then secondly, how do we also improve aquaculture development in, in Ghana? So I'm going to talk to you about how we are using um, earth observation technologies, electronic monitoring, and so forth, to, to support the activities of managers within, within that sector. So one of the key things that we, we felt that we could do to reduce IU fishing is to improve the strategies that we have in protecting our fishing space and ensuring that we have a clean environment to allow fishes to grow. So to, to do this, we need to reduce fishing capacity. It's, it's fairly easy to do. Stop registering uh, boats, stop giving license to uh, uh, fishing vessels to go out to sea, manage quota and so forth. Again, one of the things you also want to do is monitor small fishing boats because they are they have a, a part to play when it comes to IU fishing, right? So how do you know where they go, what they are doing, how much, how far they travel, who are they meeting at sea and so forth, right? Then again, build capacity and provide information to help IU fishing. So how do you resource uh, managers in the region with, with skills that can allow them to analyze AIS data, VIS data, analyze side dark ships and so forth. So um, these are these are these are some of the things we we are using earth observation to help keep IU fishing. So on this slide, see an output on on your right, a map of West Africa. It, it is it is a, a map that allows us to predict areas that we think have the optimal conditions for fishes to aggregate. And how do we do this? We use a model product from um, uh, Mercator to identify areas that are uh, that have optimal conditions. We we merge AIS data with the environmental conditions, then develop a generalized additive model that allows us to forecast. Uh, Mercator products generate forecast products periodically. So we, after setting up the model, you input this is the data that you collect periodically into the model, and you're able to predict which areas of of your um, ocean are very productive and where would vessels go. Um, ideally, to de develop this, you need catch data, so you need to know where your catch is coming from. But we we have a a, a problem in our region. The tuna fishing fleets and all the other guys do not have properly proper information on where they are catching fish. The information they put into their logbooks have a lot of errors in there, so it's it's not you can't rely on that. But when you look at VMS or AIS data, you can you can identify fishing spots from that by looking at the speeds, the speed of the vessel, the rate of turn, the cost of our ground information, and so forth. So we merge all of this to to, de in, to develop these models to predict uh, areas where we think will be productive to find fish. But like I had said, we have an overfished problem. Our region um, have a situation where we don't have a lot of fish. Everyone is taking too much. So this sort of product that we gen generate, we don't make it available to um, the fisherman. Fisherman who wants to find fish. So we actually would share this with um, fisheries managers 
Coast Guards, the navies, the MCS officers, and so forth, so that it helps in planning their um, monitoring campaigns. That that is the philosophy behind this this PFG, right? Then we are also now installing um, class B transponders on our small fishing boats. So in the past, we couldn't monitor them at all, but we piloted the project and even implemented a project that allows them to, to be tracked. So on your left, the orange um, device you see there is a class B transponder. Apart from you being able to track vessels with that device because it has an inbuilt GPS and it can talk to satellites in space, there's that the red button in the middle allows you to also uh, communicate to nearby vessels and stations at the coast when a boat is in distress. So it serves two purposes and the fishermen love it, right? So in between, you can see some wooden canoes. So those are the canoes we put these devices on them. The, the orange device can be powered by a 12 volt battery or, or yes, or a solar panel. So we can also actually power with a fire solar panel and it works very, very well. And if you don't have power on board, you don't have batteries, you can actually charge it in your room for a while and put it on for, and have it power and have it work for like three to four days. So it serves that purpose. Again, they're also using video um, to monitor the activities on fishermen, of fishermen on, in that, on industrial boats. So basically you know what they are doing uh, by analyzing the video, uh, imageries, you can even quantify how much fish they are catching and what type of fish. So this is useful, especially for the tuna uh, uh, fishing fleet. Those who go beyond um, the area beyond national national jurisdiction. It's a project by FAO and it's been implemented in Ghana. Again, we are able to also analyze AIS, uh, AIS data with some SAR imageries to detect uh, ships. So when we find that you are you are you are a dark spot. I mean, you are not reporting your position, but we know you are in a, in a side image, then uh, Navy can come out. It serves, it's useful for um, uh, maritime security and safety, apart from fisheries management. So these are some of the things we do. Again, we are able to analyze our AIS imagery to get a, get a lot of uh, information on uh, heat maps on fishing, fishing areas. Uh, we analyze to see where the vessels are coming from, which country are they coming from. Uh, do we identify any vessel that is 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 tagged as an IE fleet, and we pay attention to to them. Um, we also develop algorithms that are, allows us to detect transshipments, pair trolling, and so forth. So these are some of the things we are doing with AI is to keep IEU fishing. Um, one of the ideas that we have also been thinking about is, I mean, it, it's a bit expensive. To sign up for an AIS monitoring service and so forth. So we are thinking of also using Internet of Things where we can put a, we can have a GPS connected to an Arduino board, connected to LoRa and so forth. Uh, we can actually put uh, temperature sensors and so forth on each more boards. And we, and anytime they go out, we can collect information, analyze them and, and use them for fisheries management. So um, one of the things I also wanted to draw attention to is the fact that we have indicated we are our uh, fishing resources are, are depleted, right? So we started looking at aquaculture, but then um, we have we have this huge lake. I think it's the largest lake in the world, artificial lake in the world. It's called Lake Volta, and there were a lot of aquaculture farms out there. But then, how do we know where the farms are? Uh, how many uh, cages do they have on board? What are the sizes and so forth? So we we are using um, normal UAVs to look at them too. It's it's a project we started working on. And uh, when it becomes operational, perhaps we can talk about it again. So on your left, it's a, it's a place somewhere on, on that lake. And you can see the pens in there. So how do you detect them automatically uh, through um, image processing? We use normal RGB to do that. Down there, you can see the pens and they are floating because they, they are hooked onto um, empty, empty barrels, empty plastic barrels. And you can see it's blue. So as we go on, I'll see, I'll show you how we're using that to detect uh, the vertices of, of these pens because they are boxes. So, um, we analyze these images, we look at their pixel distribution, right? So we then tell them to find the threshold to, to split land, land from water. After doing that, um, we do that using a normalized band ratio and the thresholding within the blue band. Then 
we have the, we are able to fetch land from, from from water. Then we go on further to do some line detection along our roads and columns. Then we are able to come out with these. Now, when we have we find these vectors, obviously we can then count, know the size, and even estimate the number of fishes in there. So it's a technology we are developing, and this is how we are using Earth observation out here. Um, I don't. I, I think I'm done now, and um, thanks for your attention. Kwame, that was super and uh, very interesting on both sides, both the agriculture side and the fishery side. We'll come back to some questions about that uh, shortly. So let me ask Benvendo, are you able to present at this moment? Benvendo, you are muted. Okay. Um, let's give him a, another moment. There's Benvendo. Can you share your screen and also you need to lower your camera some so that we can see and you need to unmute. Can someone unmute Benvendo uh, in the control room? Um, hello. We hello. hear you. Yes. Bevindo, can you yes. address okay. your? No. Are you seeing me now? Yes. We see. We see your presentation. Okay. So, um, can shall we start? Yes. Yes. Please start and go to presenter mode. Okay. Thank you. We can. Thank, see thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Bevindo from Fonseca from Cabo Verde, uh, the IMAR, the Institute of the Sea. I have a presentation on the sustainable fisheries uh, in, uh, in Cabo Verde. Uh, so I will briefly go to, through uh, uh, the sector in Cape Verde, the fishery sector in Cape Verde, making introductions, the sector in numbers, uh, the production and the, the value created uh, by the national, uh, to the uh, national economy, some measures, I mean, uh, management measures and uh, for the sustainable, sustainability, some uh, um, operational and strategic tools, and a little bit about the blue economy. And then we have the, the challenges and opportunities and a small conclusions for that. Unfortunately, my presentation is in Portuguese. I, I, I think it uh, not, cannot be a problem. Okay. Uh, Cabo Verde uh, has a strategic uh, uh, position. It has a, a, a land surface 4,033 kilometers square, as you can see on the on the screen. On the, and as a big Z, uh, AZ, uh, uh, seven, seven, uh, 734 thousand kilometers square. Uh, the population is around uh, uh, half a million. Um, our per annual uh, productions in average is 15 to 20 tons per year. And uh, the human consumption is around 26 kilograms per, uh, per person. Um, the fishery sector uh, plays a very important and a fundamental uh, role in the Cape Verde in the richness, I mean, in the uh, employment generation, uh, um, food security, and uh, in the also in the uh, equilibrium, uh, uh, economical equilibrium as uh, in, in general. So we have the sector in numbers. We have uh, some artisanal uh, boats, uh, uh, one, 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 one thousand fifty eighty-eight hundred. And then we have the semi-industrial and industrial also vessel, 100 and 
2019, around five uh, five thousand uh, uh, fishermen, artisanal fishermen, and uh, one thousand two hundred and five SME industrial and industrial. We have a uh, fifteen uh, industrial. Uh, uh, um, I mean, fifteen uh, uh, fishermen in uh, in these long long liner vessels, which are also uh, fishing in our AZ. Approximately 1,000 uh, uh, people in the commercializations, and uh, uh, many of them are women. And also, uh, we have in the industry, in the, in, the, in the fisheries industry, I mean, in the fish processing plants and the processing plant itself, uh, around 1,780 uh, employees. So we, in, in average, from 2007 to 2017, the national uh, 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 captures was uh, 10,060 uh, tons. Uh, from, from those, 42% uh, uh, tuna and tuna fisheries and tuna species, small pelagics, 38%. Dimersols 13 and uh, several other species 17. In terms of exportation, in 2017 we uh, made 7,500 uh, uh, 7, uh, tons and it is around 9 million uh, euros. And also, this uh, uh, export represents 70% of the total Cape Verde export. Uh, it's contribute the fisheries contribute for uh, uh, for the DGP around one one uh, one point two percent. It's a modest contribution, but with a great uh, uh, signification, because five percent of the population uh, 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 are uh, employed. If from those, uh, as I said, twenty six kilogram is the consumption per per habitant. Uh, what are the instruments, strategic instruments we have in operations, I mean, to promote or to, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, fisheries, sustainable fisheries? We have a management plan of the fisheries resources, uh, which we have also the, the strategic plan for the development. It's the, the, the government from 17 to 2021. Uh, we have uh, a strategic for uh, uh, blue blue growth, national strategic for blue growth. We have the, uh, monitoring, control, and uh, surveillance, uh, sanitary control and certification of product. We have a legislation, a fisheries legislation, uh, and access to to to, to the resources. Um, also, we have a national plan. To, for uh, uh, this uh, Ill uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries in, uh, in Cabo Verde, apart from the, 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 the protocols, the other conventions related to these issues. We have the, co the Code of Conduct for a Responsible Fisheries, uh, the FAO. Uh, and also, uh, 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 we have this uh, to, to empowerment or to, to reinforce these marine protected areas that. Uh, we also uh, we have this, this management plan for this, those those areas in Cabo Verde. We also we have this uh, this agreement and fisheries agreement and uh, cooperation with uh, other other uh, other uh, nations, namely the European Union. So, what are the measures for the conservation for a sustainable fish? We have we have some biological uh, measures. We have these those uh, uh, periods that it's not allowed to fish, and also we have established minimum sizes for some species. For instance, we have the minimum size for for mackerel, which is the Capturus macarellus, and also for Sela uh, curmonostalus, which is 20 centimeters for for to the, the to the mackerel, and uh, also 20 centimeters uh, as a minimum size for this Sela curmonostalus. We have the 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 the, the, the group the, the spinelli lawis, which is uh, that same thing. Then we have this pineal uh, pineal little which is the lobster, um, which the period it goes it's uh, that protected period is uh, the July first to 
third, uh, 3rd November, and the Carapace lens minimum should be 20 centimeters. Also, we have the coastal lobsters, which uh, is from May 1st to October 1st, and the carapace, the minimum carapace lens should be 20 centimeters also. We have some species protected, as for instance, uh, marine turtles, and then we have uh, some cetaceans also, and uh, several species of uh, uh, shark species, we have blue sharks, white sharks, and, uh, and, and other uh, uh, sharks uh, as a protected species. So, in relation to this uh, blue economy, since 2014, the FAO uh, uh, has the initiative to, to uh, have, have, we become very happy to, to make this initiative to the blue, blue growth, uh, and uh, it have, and to have given support to Cap Verde on these uh, initiatives. This initiative for, for the Blue Growth, uh, it, is, uh, 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 it is seen or it is appointed as a, a strategic and uh, uh, means for the, to, uh, uh, to direct and implement the, these, uh, the, agenda, the, the agenda, as for instance, it is uh, in, in uh, 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 in the, uh, the, the this sustainable development goals 14, this uh, uh, SDG 14. Uh, the objectives of the goals is to create the conditions, uh, formal conditions and the transitions and the transition for this blue, uh, blue growth to um, uh, uh, improve the government's uh, uh, the ecosystems, uh, aquatic ecosystem. Uh, to preserve the biodiversity and the habitat, and uh, also to, to responsibilize the, the, the stakeholders or the, the users of those, of the, those resources. So uh, we have already in plan this strategic, uh, the strategic framework, uh, also the, the national plan for the investments, also the, plura, the pluriannual uh, program for these transactions, and we have this that we call the observatory uh, that the blue blue economy. And then we have some challenges. We have, the, of course, we have the, the climate change and the, its impact in the fisheries. Uh, we have also uh, these to to uh, to support the co-management in order to 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 more involve the 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 fisheries communities on the fisher management process. We have this research, development, and technology also that should be uh, in, in place. We, we, are, we are now uh, with the, this, the new institute, uh, the IMAR, we are going to this uh, uh, to, to focus more on the, the uh, uh, applied research, not only for aleotic, but also the economical, social, and uh, all the and technologies related to, to, to these, uh, these issues. Uh, we also have to adequate um, our national legislation, national and international legislation, as we are part of uh, uh, many uh, 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 conventions and protocols and, and so on. Uh, we, we have to, to ameliorate uh, this, uh, to, to, uh, to, to make a, an evaluation and to, to, to improve the management uh, of these marine, marine protected areas. Uh, also, we have to, to reinforce the platform uh, against the EU fishing to sensibilize the, uh, and communicate and uh, also to, the, to, to inform uh, our, our users and stakeholders about this EU plan. Uh, all, of course, we have this uh, the capacity to to the the the, 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 the uh, fiscalization of the world. Of, uh, we, we have this uh, institution related, which is the man, uh, IMP, which is the, the Port Management Coast Guard, the General Directorate of Marine Fisheries, and so the Coast Guard that has this uh, VMS system, AI system, in order to 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 make this uh, uh, more more efficient. Uh, of course, we have this uh, uh, strategic plan to the, for the development of aquaculture, because in Cape Verde we, uh, it's, uh, we still have uh, 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 that aquaculture sector uh, uh, in uh, embryonic phases, I would say, 
and also we have we should have a legislation specific legislation for the aquaculture uh, and then we have the renewable energy on the fisheries which is related to the the uh, sustainable development goals number seven because uh, 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 in fisheries in Cabo Verde we, we think that there is a great potential to 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 to, to use the, uh, the the renewable energy. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, already some some pilot experience in in, Sa, in San Vicente, San Nicolau, and uh, also in uh, in San Juan Town. We have uh, an aquaculture uh, station which this shrimp aquaculture in San Vicente, and also they 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 have uh, their. Uh, plan to, to invest in this uh, renewable energy in order to uh, 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 make the cost of, of the, this uh, energy uh, less and more, more efficient. So as I said, the fishery sector have an uh, uh, in our, in our enormous potential for this uh, renewable energy, uh, especially in the ice production also and this, uh, the, the chain, the, the, the freezing chain uh, that is very crucial for the 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 the, 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 commercial, the the production and commercialization of the of the fishes. Some opportunities we have this uh, an extension of the continental shelf uh, for farther from the 200 nautical miles. But this is an issue that it's not only Cabo Verde, but it's a, a joint uh, uh, proposal that are submitted to the to this committee. Um, we have this uh, a gradual gradual tran uh, transition from the artisanal fisheries to the industrial. We think it's, it's, a, it's a, an opportunity that uh, should be developed. The uh, the infrastructure the inf infrastructuring of the fisheries sector. We have also in places uh, a plan of infrastructure. I mean, with uh, 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 marine ports and uh, also the infrastructure to to, to support the fisheries. Uh, the cost reductions of the, the production means, as I said, uh, 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 ice productions, cold storage, and so on, by using uh, uh, renewable energy. And of course, we have to 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 for, to to make it to empower also the, the partnership with uh, uh, in international international institutions. We already have the GOMAR, universities, institution, research institutions. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And for instance, as we said, the, the, activity, the fisheries activities in Cape Verde, uh, nevertheless, we have several uh, uh, challenges also, and uh, a lot to do to development, for the development of uh, the, the socioeconomical aspect of the country. But we think that uh, the, the, the objectives of the sustainable development are in, uh, in, in uh, are in, uh, in alignment with the fisheries in Cape Verde. I would say, or the, the number one, which is the no poverty. The number two, uh, 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 zero hungry, uh, good health and uh, well-being. The seven, uh, um, the, the uh, growth and. Uh, uh, the, the, the energy, renewable energy, and also this is the production and consumption, uh, sustainable production and consumptions, um, the, the life below the below below water. So this, those are uh, the, the that we have more focus. I mean that has the, the weight in the, of the sustainable fisheries with in that in the line with the, G, the sustainable development goals. So in briefly, uh, sorry for uh, my time. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, yeah, your attention. All right, thank you, Benvendo. Um, next, we're gonna have Michael give his presentation and Jorge from Brazil is just come on as a possible substitute for Marcelo. But Michael, you're up next. All right, thank you. Let's see, have you got this? Is it in sharing mode? Or are you seeing it as a shared view? Uh, it looks like a shared view, yes. Okay, all right. 
Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Michael Ruccio. I'm with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Fisheries Service here in the United States. And it's my pleasure today to speak to you a little bit about sustainable fisheries in the United States. NOAA Fisheries is responsible for the stewardship of our nation's ocean resources and their habitat. The, that didn't advance, did it? There we go. Uh, the overarching domestic legislation for fisheries in the United States is the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, or the Magnuson-Stevens Act for short. Using the act as a guide, NOAA Fisheries works in partnership with regional fishery management councils and state fishery management agencies across the United States to provide a science-based management and conservation system for fisheries and protected resources. In addition to the Magnuson-Stevens Act that governs commercial and recreational fishery in U.S. waters, NOAA Fisheries, my agency, is also responsible for stewardship under a number of other domestic laws, including the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Endangered Species Act, and our environmental, uh, National Environmental Policy Act. The Magnuson-Stevens Act isn't just about fish, it's also about fishery participants. The MSA cites a finding that commercial and recreational fishing constitutes a major source of employment and contributes significantly to the economy of the United States. And the overarching goal of sustainable fisheries in the US is to promote domestic and commercial recreational fishing under sound conservation and management principles using maximum sustainable yield is the primary management benchmark. Um, the Magnuson-Stevens Act has been reauthorized a couple of times since its inception, once in 1996 and again in 2006. And collaboratively, the Magnuson-Stevens Act and its amendments and its reauthorizations have brought us to where we are today in the United States. And that is that chronic overfishing is a thing of the past in our waters and our federally managed fisheries are on a solid sustainable footing. Our ocean fisheries provide many benefits, food, enjoyment, fun, a place to connect with nature. And today US fisheries are recognized as being responsibly managed under a transparent process based on science, responsible management and for standards and full stakeholder participation. And to break down kind of these three pillars, um, the science is world-class. It includes rigorous peer review, provides fishery managers with the information necessary to make informed decisions on management. The management process and coordination with the eight regional fishery management council, it's public, it's transparent, and it's science-based, and it ensures continuous improvement of fishery management in response to new information and new ideas. And then the third pillar, Enforcement, our enforcement program together with state and federal part monitors more than 5.5 million square kilometers of open ocean and over 153,000 kilometers of US coastline over which we have jurisdiction. And by overseeing compliance with all applicable laws, we ensure accountability to the resource and the economies and communities that rely on it. The United States has the second largest EEZ in the world, and it makes sense that the fisheries within it would be incredibly diverse. Biologically, economically, culturally, the fisheries of the United States could not be more different. We have small artisanal fisheries to large scale industrial removal fisheries um, and everything in between. To effectively manage the second largest EEZ in the world with these diverse fisheries in it, the Magnuson-Stevens Act established a system of eight regional management councils that are charged creating conservation and management measures to support sustainable harvest of regional fisheries. Each council is comprised of voting members that include one representative from NOAA Fisheries, one from each state fishery agency within the region, and additional voting members that are nominated by state governors. These include commercial and recreational fishermen, environmentalists, academic and government scientists, and others with vested interest in fisheries management. These stakeholders bring strong expertise and unique perspectives to the challenges facing fisheries in each region, each region and create the plans that are designed to meet the objectives under the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Part of the rationale for this detailed management structure is designed to foster sustainability. And there's a direct linkage between healthy fisheries and their economic contribution to the United States. We report annually on the status of our stocks uh, as a means to highlight progress in rebuilding fish stocks, which in turn 
contributes to the broad positive economic impact of commercial and recreational fisheries on the U.S. economy. Commercially, uh, excuse me, commercial and recreational fishing in 2007 generated uh, 244 billion U.S. in sales, contributed 111 billion U.S. to our GDP, and supported 1.7 million jobs. These annual reports to Congress that I just mentioned outline performance information for 461 stocks or stock complexes within U.S. waters. The 2019 status of stock report shows that the number of U.S. fisheries, ex fisheries experiencing overfishing, where the removal rate from the fishery exceeds established thresholds, remains near all-time lows. 93% of the federally managed stocks, stocks are not currently subject to overfishing. I will note that some portion of the stocks we monitor have unknown overfishing status, given that we do not have the data necessary to make such determinations. But we continually seek to increase monitoring and prove our knowledge about the status of stocks. The other important metric that we monitor is overfish status. And in 2019, 81% of the federally managed stocks were not overfished. And again, these are for stocks with known status. Overfish stocks are a stock that has a population size that is deemed too low. And it's important to recognize that an overfish stock could be depleted from too high a fishery removal rate or from other factors such as habitat degradation, pollution, climate change, or environmental variability. And on that third pillar of which we spoke for sustainable fisheries management in the United States is a system of enforcement. We need effective enforcement and compliance. NOAA has an office of law enforcement that directly supports the core mission and mandates of NOAA fisheries and through its efforts enforces and promotes compliance with the Magnuson-Stevens Act as well as all other marine resource protection laws in the United States and other implementing regulations under our purview. It's important to have these compliant measures and to enforcement so fishery participants who follow the rules can reap the benefits of fair competition and an even playing field in the market. I wanted to touch on some of the latest efforts uh, that are emerging within the United States aquaculture. Um, the United States sees a substantial untapped potential for aquaculture. Our total production relative to total land and water is relatively small. And as a nation, nearly 85% of the seafood we consume is imported with about half of that coming from aquaculture. Aquaculture is also expanding rapidly worldwide and expanding US capabilities can add to the global production system and further ensure food security. NOAA Fisheries is uh, actively engaged in multifaceted efforts involving aquaculture. And these range from trying to reduce the regulatory burden to obtain a permit to conduct aquaculture activities in US waters to supporting research on multiple scientific endeavors related to the management, production and environmental impacts of aquaculture. We've also learned that there's really no endpoint to sustainable fisheries. As I mentioned before, many of our stocks have, by most metrics, very good health. Um, but we realize that it's a journey of continuous collaboration, monitoring, and adapting to ever-changing ocean environments. Um, Ecosystem-based fisheries management is designed to be adaptive and cost-effective. And we believe we can create a framework for this that has a number of benefits. We see that developing ecosystem-based fishery management approaches can better evaluate trade-offs between different stakeholder priorities, balance social and ecological needs, provide more information to make management decisions, which should improve our ability to further sustainably manage fisheries, can contribute to an increased ability to predict outcomes of sustainable management actions, and provide more stability at an ecosystem level. And that may translate into better regulatory stability and business planning capabilities for fishery participants. We've resolved some of the most challenging issues for sustainable fisheries within US waters over the past few decades, but new ones continue to emerge. Uh, changing oceanographic conditions and dynamic climate variability are affecting the distribution and abundance of many stocks. And in some cases, maybe preventing them from rebuilding to sustainable levels. We feel we need to adapt our methods of assessing and managing these fish stocks under this new environment. And to begin this work, 
we have a comprehensive climate science strategy that's part of a proactive approach to increase production, delivery, and use of climate-related information and fulfilling our mandates to manage sustainable fisheries. This strategy identifies seven objectives shown here, which will provide decision makers, fishery participants, and fishery managers the information they need to reduce impacts and increase resilience under dynamic and changing conditions. And though I don't have slides for this, one of the things that kind of struck me as we were queuing up for our presentations today was the conversation of the ongoing pandemic. And interestingly, I think um, fishing and fishery related activities are deemed essential services in the United States. So our fishery participants have been at sea during the pandemic. Seafood continues to flow, although there has been substantial impacts primarily from restaurants and other food service venues that have been interrupted or even shut down during the pandemic, but fishery participants continue to work at sea under extending very challenging conditions here. Um, and with that, that is the last slide I have. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Michael. Very engaging and bringing out questions in my head about the international aspects of fisheries. Uh, let's see, is George a still here or is he, can he present or does he want to present? He's not here. All right. So uh, do we have any questions from the audience? And if not, I'm going to uh, provoke questions based on uh, myself being a consumer <laughs> and a scientist. Okay, let's see. Message coming in. Okay, so let me let me start by saying that all four presentations were interesting. Some of the things, some of the 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 big themes that I saw come up were innovation, um, this issue about there's a connection between aquaculture and fisheries that seems to be tightly connected, but we still kind of talk about them as separate uh, issues. I see Georges come back. Um, Tanya, could you ask Georges if he wants to present? Uh, Jorge or Georgie. If Jorge, um, he's George. George. George, do you want to present anything? George is from Bahia, I am assuming. Well, let me just throw out a question then. Um, and let's start with the present and work forward. Uh, Michael mentioned the COVID situation. And um, I would like to know from Vivendo, from uh, Serge, from Kwame, do you know the impacts of COVID-19 on the fisheries in your country? You know. Is there data to support that it's going down, it's maintaining? Uh, anyone could start with that. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so, so the risk of COVID-19 in, in, in South Africa has obviously um, been on several, several fronts. One is the um, lack of social support mechanisms um, in fisher communities. Um, the lack of adequate health services, and um, and if you know uh, people get um, really sick from 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 the coronavirus, um, there are very few opportunities to get um, get the kind of right kind of medical medical support. Thank goodness, overall, um, the kind of the penetration of the of the of the virus um, or the pandemic in um, in coastal communities has not been. Too bad. It's mostly been around or concentrated around the urban areas. 
Um, we'll see how that evolves over time. Um, what it has affected though is that many of small scale fisheries um, connect to export markets for their higher value species, think lobster. Those have completely crashed. Um, so from day one to day two, the um, the livelihood of many many of these fisheries was uh, at stake. Um, many people argue, okay, all right, export channels have been um, have been have been closed, but fishers can still fish for food security and um, to support their coastal community. And there's quite a few assumptions behind that. Um, we've seen very clearly that that is not possible. Um, even small scale fishing is is expensive. You've got to put fuel on on on, on your boat, and fishing you know purely for for food security for local barter in your community um, is is nearly impossible in this in this day and age in in, in a country like South Africa. So um, what we've tried to do in our program, working with various other organizations, is to is to secure at least a market component um, that could um, that is a little bit more lucrative that connects you know fishers with um with home consumers middle upper income population in the urban areas to then at least um channel some of the catch and offer fishers an opportunity to in effect subsidize the other portion of the catch for for local sale for local consumption for local food security but again that isn't only possible is there a, through this digital marketplace that connects you know these different market opportunities um, many fishers who are, are not connected to um, to this kind of program have um, have really struggled have have not been able to go to sea and have the, have um, have relied heavily on a, on a government government grant system and the distribution of uh, of food parcels by um, by various community based organisations churches non government organisations. Very interesting. Uh, Kwame? Yes. Um, um, out here in Ghana, um, I would say um, the pandemic did not affect most, most of the London sites because most of them are not in urban centers, right? So most of the lockdowns that we had were in urban centers. So parts of Cape Coast, Elmina, so forth, um, guys could go out to, to fish. Except that one of the things that was so so obvious was that they were not sticking to this uh, restriction on in space. You know, um, most of the beaches were super crowded. So the paper where this gentleman used um, a UAV took images and looked at the proximity between people, and he, we realized that most people were very very close. So um, yes, um, the effect I wouldn't say that in, in the coastal towns and all of that the effect was was so so significant i mean at the end of the day people were a bit careful so they would watch how they move around and engage in, in activity but i wouldn't want to completely say that um most of the fishing uh, uh, towns largely uh, had the effect of, of the pandemic benvindo tell us about capo verde and COVID 19. And you have to take your mute off. Good. Tanya? Yes? We can't, he needs his, can you take his? Uh, um, I can't, so it's, it's Topher. Oh, Topher. Hello. Oh, it's all good. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes. We can hear you. We were asking about COVID-19 and yeah. the fisheries. Uh, okay, uh, here in Cabo Verde, the, the COVID-19, uh, I would say still controlled, but uh, we have uh, some uh, concerns because, uh, as you said, uh, um, as you uh, you can uh, uh, you can see uh, the situation. We, we have uh, 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 new cases every day, around in average 70 k uh, um, uh, uh, day, daily cases. Uh, the death we are uh, we have uh, 60, I think it's 60, 65, 67 cases of death. 
uh, but it's not equal in, in all the islands. The situation is, uh, is uh, more concerned in the Santiago Islands, uh, where is the, the focus now. Uh, here in San Vicente, the situation is, uh, is more, more, uh, it's, uh, more controlled. I, I would say uh, we only uh, per day, maybe daily uh, four, uh, five, or uh, some, some, sometimes uh, one cases per day. So it's uh, more or less controlled. The other islands, the neighboring islands, such San Quentin, San Nicolau, also, it's quite the situation. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, controlled. But the, the more problematic is the Santiago and also uh, Sal, also Sal Island. Are a little bit concerned because uh, it is a to uh, uh, touristic island. So we we are doing everything to to control the situation and try to to make it better for the for the, in a near future uh, in order to 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 go back to the the the, the activities and 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 thus uh, uh, to ameliorate the economic situation. Uh, of, the, of the country. Uh, Benvendo, stay with me because I want to, I'm going to wrap back around again with this COVID question okay. because it's multidimensional. So Cabo Verde or the U.S. or Ghana or South Africa, obviously people need money to buy fish. And yeah. so there's not just a one-way connection. You could catch the fish but if you don't have people to buy it, what's the point? So I'm coming back around and asking this question and also this question about fishing markets like in Ghana. Um, do we know if the, the, the consumers, the people who buy the fish, have they been negatively impacted in such a way that they can't buy as much fish? And then and the second question related to that is, in many places you have these fishing markets. Do they enforce social distancing in those social markets? Uh, yes. So uh, here I would, uh, I would like to distinguish uh, uh, two, two, two situations. One uh, related to the fisheries consumption and production. Uh, we have the local market, which uh, uh, is uh, more affected, let's say a little bit affected with the, with the COVID-19. Uh, because, as you said, the 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 buying uh, potential, the, the buying power power of the people, uh, uh, some of them uh, are reduced, but they are or we are staying, uh, uh, we are still uh, continuing uh, uh, consuming uh, fish, because also it it is a uh, very cheap compared with the other types of proteins. Uh, for instance, uh, these uh, mackerels and uh, the all other small pelagic species, uh, which is uh, caught by the, for instance, for the artisanal sectors or artisanal boats, uh, this is mainly for the local local consumption. But and then we have these semi-industrial and industrial vessels. They continue fishing, but they, 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 the market is mainly the, the, the processing plant. And the processing plant is still buying, I mean, the, all the, 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 the catches uh, 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 provided by the, the semi and the industrial vessels. So these, that is these two, these two uh, aspects. Mm. Thank you. Uh, uh, Serge, tell us about your markets. Yeah, so look, in, in South Africa, no, and as in many parts of the world, no, no doubt that um, Sort of we for us it started in in around late March, um, and our lockdown went into effect um, uh, pretty much at the end of March. All those restaurants, all those chefs, all those hotels, resorts that um, that purchase fish, I mean, they closed you know, from day one to day two. Um, they closed overnight, um, and it's only now that they're starting to reopen and 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 there's some 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 activity. Um, in terms of you know the the general public in an urban area uh, purchasing fish, um, again, no doubt many people were affected um, because they had to go on short time in their in their companies or or even lost their job. N nevertheless, the the realization um, and and the need to secure 
um, good quality protein and local fish um, uh, in those households has, has definitely been been quite quite significant. And so very often fish is more affordable than 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 other products as well, especially in very short supply chains. Um, when it comes to um, uh, more marginalised um, sector of society. Um, there, it's it's been it's been it, they've been severely severely affected. There, it's really been about working with charities, with soup kitchens, with food kitchens, and distributing, um, raising donations and distributing um, from vegetables to to fish, um, uh, really from a kind of a humanitarian crisis angle. Um, so. Um, Fishers have kept fishing. Um, they've probably fished a little bit less than before, but they've tried to secure or sustain their livelihoods and and diversify markets by connecting again with with various players that um, that perhaps you know weren't as active before. Um, Michael, I'm going to come to you last. Kwame, could you please uh, tell us about your view on the economic yeah. side of fishing? Yes, yeah, so um, I had indicated earlier, I mean, um, social distancing enforcement w wasn't that hard in those parts of Ghana, right? Right, so, um, and obviously, fishermen, the little understanding of how the disease is transmitted and all of that, we're not looking to that. So but they will step out, go out and engage each day, get things done and all of that. But one of the things that we realized was that most of them don't own their canoes, especially the small industrial. And yeah, so what what happens is that they don't have money to well, people who own the canoes who are in normal businesses who, because of COVID, well, we're, we're not constantly working and getting money to to fill these boats. So quite a number of them were not going. Those who could go could go out there, get fish, and, and how to. To sell. So the number of fish actually find on the market reduced a bit, but but likely um, the reason was not because fishermen because of COVID could not go out to fish, but because those who fund uh, their fishing activities did not have the funds to get it out to sea, right? So that that was one one of the things we realized out here. And how how about people's ability to buy fish? Is it is it okay there? Um, at that time, I would say no, because most people were not earning that much, you know. So they would only do with the little that they could find. And obviously, when um, fishes are not are not out there abundantly, then the demand goes high, then the prices also go high. So that that was the observation. Yeah. Okay, uh, Michael, you have a very complex fishing community and a uh, buyer community in the U.S. So do we know what's happening in terms of supply demand in the U.S.? Snippets, I think. Um, we're still very actively engaged with trying to ascertain the impacts of the pandemic. Um, and there's numerous facets that are involved with that, depending on you know the type of fleet, the type of fishery, the type of market that was typically served. Um, so. As I said, we've we've been very active in trying to collect and understand the impacts both on fishery participants, but as well as how markets have responded. Uh, I mentioned in my talk one of the one of the very immediate impacts was the closure or disruption of service at restaurants. Uh, a lot of our kind of middle to lower tier fishery participants and uh, in, in size of their organization direct market or they market in a way that it ends up in domestic restaurants. So that was very disrupted. Um, what we've seen in response is that some of these vessels have started to market directly. We've seen a lot of kind of pop-up markets where people are now advertising, you know, short a table, uh, direct marketing, setting up stands roadside, and whether or not that can offset what their economic losses were from their normal markets, we're still trying to understand. Um, but it's been very fluid, very dynamic. I would mention too, it's it's been interesting with some of the very large scale industrial fisheries, you know, talking about vessels of several hundred meters long um, with crews or two or three hundred people in some cases. 
They've actually developed systems where they will cohabitate in quarantine for weeks before deployment at sea and then have very rigorous protocols for trying to ensure that COVID is not introduced onto the vessel. And then if someone does test positive, there are protocols to remove them and try to minimize exposure. So a number of the fisheries have continued to operate, um, but it's very unclear um, exactly how markets have been affected and, and overall what the outcome will be. But we're, we're very active in trying to collect that information. Okay, we, uh, we're gonna go to the Zoom chat, is it the breakout room in about five minutes. The audience would, would see a link and they could come over. Um, so I hope you guys can stay because I'm pushing you because this is, I, I feel like COVID-19 is one of these issues tied to resilience and it's closely related to some disruption in the future or near future related to climate change. And, you know, when I hear you guys talk, you know, I think about your shipping, you know, your shipping, the zones where you can catch fish, but they are still like borders, right? So in a certain sense, there's like a landlocking place out to 200, you know, miles or whatever the distance is. And I'm wondering, you know, is there international cooperation in these kinds of situations where, for example, how do you stabilize a, 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 a local, let's say national fishing market through a partner country? Like, is there, are people talking about how do we stabilize this? Because in the future, in the future, it's quite possible that fish will migrate to new zones. So a zone that currently has fish might not have fish. And so there will have to be some kind of cooperation as it relates to food security and just stabilizing fishing markets and the, the connecting markets. I wanted to get your thoughts on those. Anybody could answer. Like just the whole point about their borders tied to, and is there cooperation that we know? Sure. If, if I can yes. jump in, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm, well, I'm less well versed in terms of international cooperation, but as I mentioned, we have a number of regional based management systems within our purview. And we see that governance is very difficult to kind of tease out as, sh as stocks begin to shift. Um, we're seeing that fish that were normally found in southern climes are, are more northerly. Um, and fish that are at the northern extremes of their distribution are, are leaving our waters and, and are more prevalent in Canada. Um, it is very much an emerging issue. And it's something that I think we're still trying to sort out. Um, part of the complicating factor for us is, is understanding mechanistically why this is happening, understanding the science, trying to be more predictive uh, in that capacity, I think will help answer some of the governance issues. Kwame? Yes, um, there is a lot of collaboration at a scientific level, policy level, and management and so forth. So, um, I mean, in most in most parts of the world, there are sub-regional or regional fisheries bodies, and they constantly work together to ensure that uh, stranding species and all of that are properly taken care of. So, um, I would say I would say yes. Um, it, at the national level and at, even at the institutional level. We also talk a lot among ourselves and work together, share information. So, so that issue is is not a problem. You know, it's, it 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 doesn't affect how we can ensure that fish stays on the table. No, um, one key thing that there's a that we find a lot of collaboration also at, is at the monitoring, control, and surveillance level. I mean, for instance, in West Africa, most of the coastal states have some sort of a, a surveillance stra strategy in place. But there is also that um, regional cooperation. So there are regional bodies that also work together with these countries to coordinate uh, monitoring and surveillance activities. So there is constant collaboration to ensure that um, officers don't 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 run away. <laughs> okay. Uh, how about Serge? What what's your this issue about regional cooperation or international? Yeah. Look. <laughs> I'm going to come at it from a completely different angle. For sure, uh, among various countries in, in Southern Africa, there's regional collaboration. 
um, when it comes to transboundary stocks and understanding um, the population dynamics of these stocks, the, 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 the various management frameworks in the different countries, and the potential um, implications of, of, um, of, of climate change and, and, and our environmental changes. Um, so I'm looking at a different kind of, of regional collaboration around securing rights and securing um, customary fishing rights um, along the South African coastline. Uh, or along the African coastline. And there I see quite a lot of collaboration at uh, African Union level, connecting with United Nations, um, the recently published small scale fisheries guidelines, and really trying to connect, you know, secure fishing rights in fishing communities with um, with collective action and 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 and, and market, market resilience and diversified market channels. I think it's pretty clear that the uh, the COVID-19 or the the, 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 the pan this pandemic here has woken a lot up a lot of people around the 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 heavy dependence on 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 export um, of some products and import of others um, while developing a slightly more resilient or or self sustainable lo local market at least for quite a few of these small scale fishery resources is um, is, is 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 critical. Benvendo. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I think it is a, a very uh, important uh, issue because uh, this is the time that that this partnership and cooperation should be should be more more effective. More, uh, uh, not only these uh, the researchers, the industry, the science, and uh, and the government, but also. The, the cooperation, uh, regional cooperation, international cooperation, uh, uh, we, 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 sh we should make synergies in order to, to better manage the resources we, we, we have. Uh, more to, in, then we extract more protein, uh, probably new species that are not uh, uh, until now uh, in the the in the, uh, in the habits of the, of, of the of, of the people, for instance. But we we have to manage. We have to, to think about uh, all the possibility. But this is possible, of course, when we have the synergies and partnership on all the fishing communities, the researcher, the government, uh, uh, the the civil society, and uh, and so on. This is a crucial crucial moment. Crucial important because as you said we already have this impact of the climate change so now we have this COVID-19 so and then those with the COVID-19 will even jeopardize uh, the, the a little bit the, the, the situation of course it is a, there is a whole world issues whole world concerns problems uh, but we, we we should do we should think and think more effective and try to to find ways uh, to, 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 to get more, more benefit from, from the resources, uh, the marine resources uh, or uh, other resources in order to overcome this uh, impact, both uh, of COVID and also of the climate change. 